saw how Simon the magician, instead of wanting your Holy Spirit, wanted the power that came along with it. I pray God, like the song said, that we would want you more than anything. The healer over the healing. The savior over the saving. You, God, more than what you can offer. And if we have you, we have everything. We pray for this, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ron was traveling on a boat. He had just, uh, he had just gone to a Christian academy that his friend uh, invited him to. The Christian academy uh, had, a, had a week of prayer, and he went there, and he checked it out. He actually cut school to go check it out. And as he was going there, he, the messages, well, for the first time, he kind of heard it in a different way. Sometime after that, he got on a boat. And as he was on the boat, a big storm hit. And at that moment, he started to think in his mind, this may be the end. I mean, running in gangs, he, he, he had a lot of close calls. He had his friend's head blown off in front of him. He's had others that he knew uh, die from drugs and all types of craziness. Could he have survived all of that? And he, was he going to die in the middle of a storm? Why did he get on this boat anyway? And he made a prayer to God and said, God, if you can look upon me on this boat right now and if you could save me, I'll change my ways. And the storm stopped. He couldn't believe it. If it was ever a miracle that he ever experienced, it was that right there. But as quickly as the storm stopped and went away, his promise to God went away. When he got to that shore, he forgot about God. You know, uh, a lot of times when God is convicting us, there is like a battle, a fight that takes place. We read about Saul two days ago and how Saul uh, saw Stephen get murdered right in front of his eyes. And they put the coats at his feet they entrusted it with him, and he consented to the death of Stephen. And at that moment, he uh, most likely started getting some conviction. God started to try to reach him. He was there as he heard the sermon by Stephen. And maybe Sir Stephen's sermon fell on deaf ears that day. Because everybody there says they were cut to the heart. You remember we said that? They were cut to the heart. They were convicted. But instead of giving in to God, they, oh, they put their teeth together and they came after him and, 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 and in unison. They went and they grabbed him and they arrested him and they brought him out and they stoned him. Saul was one of those guys who was there, who was cut to the heart and uh, fought against it. It was the very next chapter, what we covered yesterday, where Saul started to create havoc on the church. It's because when people are convicted, either one or two things happen. Either they get closer to God, they give in to God, or they harden their heart. Saul hardened his heart, and instead of going towards God, he was fighting against God. You see, for us, when God convicts us, we can either, either give in to God or we can fight against him. How many times do we hear 
a message, maybe a sermon or, or an appeal, or maybe uh, you're, you're just reading the Bible and something stands out to you and you're being convicted. And then the first thing we do is we start to rationalize in our minds why not, why we shouldn't. We start thinking to ourselves, no, nah, no, nah, that doesn't apply to me. No, no, no. No, that's not what it means. No, nah, no. Nah. I remember doing a Bible study with a group of people, and we got to the topic of baptism, and I was actually talking about rebaptism and the reason behind rebaptism. And that Bible study erupted. Never was there so much discussion and people stayed late and because people were just so battling with the thought. And they were thinking about, well, why wouldn't it and why wouldn't it not apply and all these things. And at the end of the day, it's like it got you to think. When people are convicted, a battle rages inside. And that's why now in Acts chapter 9, chapter, verse 1, it says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Breathing. Whoa. What a word. Breathing threats. It was like now which is a part of his life. As essential as breathing, it became a way of life for him. <sighs> breathing the threats against the people of God, breathing murder, it was coming down their necks, the breath. And because he was breathing these threats and talking about murder and he was wanting to, to, to get to stop the Christians, he went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the, to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Damascus? Whoa. You know how far Damascus is from Jerusalem? That's over 150 miles away. To get to Damascus, I mean, I know that when, the, 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 when Saul was leading and, and being one of the forefathers of the persecution, people left Jerusalem and they started to go throughout Judea. And from there, they started to go into Samaria. But now, now they were fleeing into Syria. That's where Damascus is. It was in in the deserts of Syria, there was like an oasis called Damascus. And people were fleeing over there because they were trying to get away from this guy, Saul. But Saul said, give me some letters. Just give me permission that I can go over there into Damascus and get these fugitives. I mean, the Christian message was really spreading because Jesus said, start at Jerusalem, home base, go to Judea, then go to Samaria, then to all the world. People were now past Samaria going into the world. They were now in Syria and Damascus, and Saul wanted that. Saul was called a young man, and as a young man, his energy was, was driven to kill breathing the murders. He just, ooh, he wanted that murder so bad. Like one would want breath. He wanted to capture them, bring them back to Jerusalem. It says here, and he asked for letters of him of the synagogues of, of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way. If you have a King James Bible, you might not catch it, in other versions, they say the way, and that's a very accurate translation, the. That article, the, makes a big difference because people who are followers of God, followers of Jesus in particular, were not called Christians right away. 
In fact, you will only read of one place in the book of Acts where they're called Christians. That's way down the line. What they were called way before they got the nickname Christians, they were called people of the way. Why? Why were they called people of the way? Obviously, because Jesus made a statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus was the way. And so these people were called people of the way. And you see, they got that name, and it wasn't a name that, 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 uh, that they called themselves. People called them because everywhere they went and everywhere they were preaching, they were talking about the way, the truth, and the life. They kept talking about the way, and people kept hearing them talking about the way, so they called them these people of the way. They, talked, they preached about the way, Jesus Christ. They talked about the straight and narrow way. They talked about... Paul, I mean, uh, John, the baptizer, and how he said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Paths, hodos. That, 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 that Greek word, hodos. The path straight. That same word, the way, the truth, and the life. Hodos. Right here, the people of the way, hodos. People of the way. What a great name for a Christian. See, though, you know, when we talk about Christian, yeah, we're followers of Christ, right? But people of the way, those who are of the way, we're people who are on the way, people who are in Christ, people who are following Christ, people who are leading people through the way. Because Jesus said, no one can come to the Father except through me, the way. Uh, you cannot get into salvation, the sheep pen, unless you go through me, the door, the way. This was the name that the Christians had. Way before they were called Christians, they were those who were of the way. And so he wanted to... To, to put a roadblock in the way. Yeah, Saul wanted to capture the people of the way. And so he says, if he were to found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he didn't care. He might bring them bound to Jerusalem. They call these people people of the way because in their mind, they didn't like it. Because they, in their mind, the way to them, to Jews, was becoming a child of Abraham. To, to them, the way, how dare you? That's blasphemy to say that there is a way outside of Judaism to be saved. But there is salvation in no other name except Jesus. He is the only way. Jesus said it himself. He says, anybody who tries some other way is a thief and a robber. Jesus is the way. And he wanted to capture them. And as he got permission, he got the letters so that when he would show up, it was like a warrant to go into those synagogues and capture people who profess the way. And so he, as he journeyed, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly, a light shined, shone around him from heaven. Now that's some bright light, because normally if a light hits you, it hits you from one direction, but it says the light shined all around him, shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, fell off his horse that he was riding on. He dropped to the ground, knocked by the brightness. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The words coming from this voice took it personally. He said, me, 
Not why are you persecuting my people? Not why are you persecuting the apostles? Not why are you persecuting the, the disciples? Why are you persecuting me? Jesus made a statement. What you do to the least of these, you do unto me. And since Saul was killing, what well, was not killing, but, but planning to kill and, and arresting and causing havoc and, and putting them on trial for future murder and death. Since he was doing that, since he was persecuting the people of the way, he was persecuting Jesus himself. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus made a statement. He said, if you reject, if people reject you, they're rejecting me. If they disrespect you, they are dishonoring me. When you are persecuted for my name's sake, don't take offense. Persecuting me. And he said, who, 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 who are you, Lord? It's amazing how he calls him Lord. He didn't mean Lord as in God. He meant Lord as in, the word Lord means master. And he realized that whoever was speaking to him at the time, he better respect that entity. He better respect that voice. Lord, Lord, who are you, Lord? Who is, who's talking? But I recognize that you're important, Lord. Who are you, master? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Can you imagine what went through his mind? He was anti-Jesus. He was against Jesus. And when he heard somebody say, you're persecuting me. Who? Who? Who, who am I persecuting? Who are you? I'm Jesus. Uh-oh. And not just Jesus. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Oh, I didn't realize that. I, I, what? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Just tell me what you want. Because right now, he, the brightness is so hitting him so hard. The, the situation is so, so serious. And, and, and now he's hearing that this, 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 this being, this bright being. You see, when Jesus was living on this earth, he didn't shine out his uh, divinity. He was living on earth as a man. Only one moment did, the disciple, did a couple of the disciples get a glimpse of his uh, div divinity. And it kind of shone out in that mountain where he was transformed. But clearly, this situation where Jesus shows up, he's letting out a little even more divinity than he had at that mountain. Because it knocked him down. And so, of course, he says, okay, just tell me what you want. What do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city. You know, that same city where you were going to kill and, and grab and bring to trial for death? Go ahead, go into that city. And you will be told what you must do. I'll tell you what to do. Just go for now. You know, it's interesting because God does that quite often, right? He did it with Abraham. Go. I'll tell you what, what, what's up. He tells him, go. Go into that city. I'll give you instructions. He told it to the disciples, go into the city of Jerusalem and wait. Go, wait, and I'll give you my instructions. And the men who journeyed with him, who journeyed with Saul, stood speechless. Uh, why? Because they heard hearing a voice, but seeing no one. 
this illumination of Jesus Christ was only for one person's eyes. It was only for Saul. Saul was knocked to the ground. He saw the brightness. He was, saw the glimpse of Jesus, and he, and he heard his voice, and the people around, it says they heard, but they saw no one. So, in their, so for them, their speech is like, okay, what is happening? Who on earth is Saul talking to? We don't see nobody. We hear something, but why is he covering his eyes? Well, what is happening with this man? Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he obviously closed his eyes because it was so bright. And now that he uh, opened his eyes, he, he saw no one. I imagine as the, the, the people who were accompanying him, maybe some soldiers, they came over to him and said, Saul, Saul, what happened to you? Are you okay? Look at me, Saul, look at me. And when he opens his eyes, he sees nobody. Saul, what happened to your eyes? I, I, I can't, I, I, I can't see you. What on earth had happened? And so it says, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. He probably didn't want to get back on whatever he was riding. He's like, I'll walk the rest of the way. I don't want to not fall down again. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, and he was, and he was three days without sight. Neither ate nor drank. <laughs> when he went there, he said, no, no, no. God told me he would tell me what to do. I'm not doing nothing. I'm not doing nothing. I'm not even going to eat. I'm not going to drink. I'm just going to wait. And so he sat there in his dark blindness for three days. Three days. Like how Jesus was in the darkness of the grave for three days. He was in the darkness of his mind for three days. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, uh, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise, go to the street called straight. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The name of the street where Saul was staying is called straight? That cannot be a coincidence. We talked about the people of the way. And the only way that you should be is the straight way, the narrow way, the one and only way. Saul probably didn't know where he was because he was blind. But the street he ended up on was a street called straight. Jesus was straightening him out. Arise and go to a street called straight and inquire at the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Saul, when he went to that street called Straight, he really did straighten up because he was determined. Because God told him, go to that city and I will tell you what to do. Well, Saul was only doing one thing. He wasn't eating. He wasn't drinking. The only thing he was doing was praying. He was praying until he got an answer. You know, I tell people, when you got a question and you need an answer, sometimes you got to pray until you get that answer. Too many times we don't get answers because we pray for two seconds and we expect to hear God. It's like we want to hear God in our timing or something. We, we, we have a problem and we pray and we pray a little bit here. We go about our business. We pray a little bit there. We go about our business. We pray a little bit here. Come on. if you, uh, When we have a Thing and we need God's answer, sometimes we got to pray 
until we get that answer. Saul was told by God, go over there. I'll tell you what to do. And so that's exactly what Saul did. Saul didn't sit there and just twiddle his thumbs and say, well, God told me he's going to tell me what to do. No, he said, I'm going to talk to God. I'm going to ask God until he tells me what to do. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias. Wait a minute, that's me. Coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So while Saul was in the street called Straight in Damascus, that oasis in the middle of Syria, Saul was praying. And in his prayer, Saul, although he was blind, he could finally see. In his blindness, he saw a vision. And he saw Ananias coming and giving him back his sight. That was a good encouragement for, for Saul. That was a good encouragement. Okay, I can see again. Oh, that's going to be good. But it says, for behold, he is praying. So although he got a vision, he was still praying. He's like, no, nope. even though God assured me that I'm going to get my sight back, I'm still praying until it happens. So he kept praying. Then Ananias answered, uh, Lord, I have heard about many, I have heard about many, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Wait, wait, you said, you said who? You said Saul? You know how many people have told me about Saul, have warned me about, about Saul? And what he's been doing to people in Jerusalem? You mean he is here in my city? I should be getting out of the city. I shouldn't be going to him. And here, and he here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. He, wait a minute. The chief priest gave him permission to arrest anybody that's calling on your name, Jesus. What did you tell me to do? But the Lord said to him, go. There goes that word again, go. Jesus told the disciples, go, go, go. And once again, the Lord says to him, go. For he is a chosen vessel, a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles. No wonder that the author of the book of Acts, Luke, takes out time for the story of Saul. Because Luke, being a Gentile, writing to Theophilus and others who was a Gentile, hearing that now that this guy was commissioned by the Lord to be on a mission for the Gentiles, we got we to gotta talk about this guy. He is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He was going to reach everybody. It didn't matter if they were a king. It didn't matter if they were a Gentile. It didn't matter if they were an Israelite. He was out to reach all of them. I have chosen him to be my vessel. I love that word vessel. Because vessel, vessel is something that is filled or something else. He is my vessel. For I will show him many things he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, Saul did a, cause a lot of suffering, but he was going to be on the flip side of things. He was going to be on the other side of the persecution because he was going to fight for God and he would have to suffer. So it says, and Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul. I imagine as he lays his hands on him, when he touches Saul, Who, who's there? Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus 
I like how, how, how Ananias said it, said it. The Lord Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. The Lord Jesus. Don't kill me. The Lord Jesus. <laughs> the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road. I'm just reminding you. Hey, I'm just reminding you before we do anything. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came had sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, God called him a vessel. A vessel needs to be filled. And he was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've come here to give you your sight and that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, uh, there fell from his eyes <clears throat> something like scales. And he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. Now that he could see, it's like, show me the water. <laughs> the things fell from his eyes. The, 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 the calluses that probably burnt through his eye, eyes when he, when, he, when he was blinded by the brightness of, of Jesus uh, came off his eyes. And he immediately went for the water. I like that word. Immediately is going to be a word with, with, with Saul because he, he didn't wait. When, when, once he got the opportunity, he went for it, fully submitting himself to God. You know, we talked about that yesterday. We talked about, about baptism. We said how the, the Ethiopian guy, he, the Ethiopian uh, uh, ruler, uh, uh, officer, the eunuch, he saw water and says, let me get baptized now. For us, you might have that conviction for baptism. Don't wait. Be like, the, like these guys and, and get baptized. He arose and was baptized. And when he re had received food, he said, listen, I'll, he didn't eat for three days. But he went for the baptism. Then he ate. <laughs> he was, that's what he wanted to do. And so when he received food, he was strengthened. And Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. The disciples, remember, disciples are different than the apostles. Remember that. These are, disciples are all the followers of, of Jesus. And so he spent days with the disciples at Damascus. And here goes that word again. Immediately, he preached the Christ, the Messiah, in the synagogue. You see, Saul, the moment he got his sight, got baptized, ate some food, and started preaching right away. He didn't need to wait until he uh, learned more. He didn't need to wait until uh, he was a, a more mature Christian. He didn't need to wait for, for anything immediately, as soon as he got his strength by eating that food, he started preaching the gospel. What about us? How many times do we delay? How many times do we push it off? No wonder that the same guy talked about salvation like a run in a race. You got to move quick. You got to move fast. Later on, the same guy saw he writes books and he, he mentions talking about race. Run like there's only going to be one winner. Saul, as if he was on a race, got baptized immediately, started preaching immediately. Some of us have been in the church for umpteen years and have never preached, never talked to somebody about God, never tried to witness to anybody. We can't wait any longer. We if we want the Holy Spirit to really take root in our life, we got to allow the Holy Spirit to use us. So it says, immediately he preached to Christ in the synagogues then he, that he is the Son of God. This is crazy. That's why it says in verse 21, then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who, who call on the name 
on this name in Jerusalem? And, and, and has he come here for, for that purpose? So that he might bring them bound to the chief priest? Isn't this Saul the destroyer? Isn't this the, the same Saul who, who was out to get people's lives and to persecute? Wasn't this that guy who came here to this city to do the same thing to us? He went there for one reason. He went into Damascus to fight against God. But he ended up fighting for God. You see, he had a plan, but God had a different plan. Sometimes we have plans in life, and sometimes we got to allow God to autocorrect our, our plans in our life and change it up. They were amazed. It was ironic. Like, 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 like it was a, a 180 turn so quickly. Like he was just coming here for that. And a lot of times when you give your life to God, people look at you weird and say, wait a minute, are you really preaching? Are you really telling to us about God? Weren't you just the other day in the bar? Weren't you just in the other day partying? Weren't you just the other day living that kind of lifestyle? See, with God, God doesn't believe in the evolution of a Christian. Behold, I make all things new. You are a new creation. Jesus is not an evolutionist. You don't slowly morph into a Christian. No, Jesus is a creationist. You are created into a Christian. So one day you can have one life, and the next day, boom, you can have a new life. Too many people want to say, well, you know, it's a process and it's going to take some time. Immediately, he started preaching. Immediately, you become a new creation and in the process is now growth. But you have to first change and transform from one entity to another entity. You got to transform from the old man like that same Saul talked about in Romans chapter 6. You got to transform from the old man and become a new man. And that new man can grow. Let's continue on. But Saul increased all the more in strength. So he started to grow. He started to get stronger. He started to get healthier because he had to eat for, for several days. And confounded the Jews. He stumped them. Confounded the Jews who dwelt at, in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. He was ready for them because he knew all the arguments against Jesus. And so now he was able to flip it and speak for Jesus. It was all flipped around. It was all different now. You see, now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. He went there and he started talking. He was there. He originally came there to kill to, for the purpose of killing some Jews. Now the Jews wanted to kill him because most of the Jews there were not Christians. Besides some of the fugitives that got there. Now they wanted to kill him because he was trying to talk to them about Jesus. Because, hey, whoa, 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 wait, you're not on our side anymore? You, wait, 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 you, 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 you're you're on, on their side? We got to take you out. And they plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. They were waiting for him. Waiting for him to just cross one of those gates. You ain't getting out. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. <laughs> so we got to get you out of here. Listen, listen, you, uh, you're eager and I know you want to preach it, but they're going to kill you. We got to get you out. Here's a basket. Get in the basket and we're going we're gonna to put you out through the side wall because they were watching the gate. They got all the security guards there. And so Saul got out of there and he escaped. When Saul had come to Jerusalem, 100, 150 plus miles away, when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but, but they were afraid of him and did not believe he was a disciple. Wait, wait, you want to go meet the disciples? Whoa, 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 not, not you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You the popo. Get out of here. 
Well, you know, I'm different. Uh-huh, okay. That sounds like a, just like what a spy would say. Uh-uh, no, you, you ain't coming here to, with the disciples. They did not believe he was a disciple. But Barnabas, remember Barnabas? Remember the guy who sold his uh, property and, and he gave the, the money to, to the church to help those in need? Barnabas, that guy. Remember, I told you he was going to become a character. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He said, all right, forget the disciples. I'm going to take you and I'm going to bring you to the top people, the apostles. He brought him to them. And he declared to them how he had, been, had seen the Lord on the road. First of all, Barnabas was, was, Barnabas was a brave guy. Because for all he knew, he was bringing the trap bringing the Trojan horse into the apostle's room. But God must have convicted Barnabas. And he, and he was like, you know what? I'm going to give this guy a chance. Brings him, and he, and he tells him how he saw the Lord, seen the Lord on the road, Hodos, the way. He saw the Lord on the way, and that he had spoken to him. And how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. It's like, I started preaching already, guys. Listen, I'm on your side now. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. He became part of their, their crew. He, 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 and, and whenever they were going in and out of Jerusalem into Judea, he stayed with them in, in their activities. In other words, going in and out, that was an expression for the activities that they were doing. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists. The Hellenists, those were the uh, uh, Greek-speaking uh, Jews, uh, those who really adopted the, the Greek lifestyle, had more, um, they had more, uh, gave more of their, 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 uh, their allegiance to, to Rome than to Israel. He, so he was even speaking to them, but they had attempted to kill him. Everybody's trying to kill this guy. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him, sent him out to Tarsus. Oh, that, well, that's what was his hometown. So they sent him out. Listen, man, he had to leave Damascus because they were trying to kill him. Now he had to leave Jerusalem because they're trying to kill him there. Let's send you all the way back home. Go back to Tarsus because right here, this place is too dangerous for you. Saul, how ironic that, his, that he had a mission to be against God, but it flipped around and he became on a mission for God. It reminds me of the story of the guy who wrote the book on Ben-Hur. You ever heard of Ben-Hur? Uh, it became a famous movie with Charleston Heston. Uh, still to this day, no movie has beaten its Academy Awards. And so uh, the movie Ben-Hur uh, is, a, is a Christian movie. It's a movie uh, talking about God, talking about Christ. And the guy who wrote Ben-Hur originally set out to write a book to disprove God. But as he was doing the research, as he was preparing his book, as he was writing his book, he found God. And he ended up writing a book proclaiming God. And people to this day watch the, read the book, watch the movies, that's what happened with Saul on a mission against God, but end up finding God on the way. Well, let's go back and let's look at the apostles. Let's look at back at Peter and let's continue the story with Peter. It says in verse 31, Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. They were growing. They were multiplying. The, the church was growing. It was just like truly a movement. They were just spreading with the peace that the Holy Spirit was giving them, the comfort that he was giving them. The Holy Spirit was called the Comforter. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all the parts of the country, really Judea, really, uh, really that area, I should say, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda, another part of Judea. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. He was stuck in bed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, heals you. Arise and make your bed. 
that sounds so much like the story that Jesus was in, where Jesus saw a guy on a, uh, who couldn't walk on a bed. He says, arise, take up your bed and walk. Here, he tells this guy, arise, make up your bed. Peter was really following in the footsteps of his master, Jesus. Jesus the Christ heals you. Notice that distinction. It's not me healing you. It's Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Then he arose immediately. Go make up your bed. <laughs> so all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Finally, Peter kind of ventured out really outside of Jerusalem. He, he's been kind of staying in Jerusalem with the other apostles. Now he kind of ventured out. Now he went a little bit to the west and went to Lydda in, in the area of Judea. And now people were all, it says, all who dwelt there saw him and turned to the Lord. Everybody in that town gave their life to the Lord. At Joppa, a little more further uh, uh, west in Judea, at Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which, which is an Aramaic uh, word, which is translated Dorcas, which is a Greek word. Tabitha which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. This woman was a good woman, very kind, very, did a lot of charitable things. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, like I said, it wasn't too far off west, and the disciples heard that, that, heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Now, that's interesting because the woman was dead. And they went there. Either maybe they want him to be there to comfort, but or maybe they want him to come there and help. But the only person they've ever seen in their lifetime resurrect somebody was, was Jesus. Jesus uh, resurrected. And the only one that was really known was when Jesus resurrected Lazarus. And Jesus didn't, wasn't really the one who resurrected Lazarus. Remember Jesus, if you remember the story, Jesus prayed to the Father. And the Father, through Jesus, resurrected Lazarus. So, but now they heard that Peter was there, and they knew Peter was on a roll. I mean, people are throwing uh, sick people to go hit his shadow. So Peter, they saw something was special with Peter and said, Peter, you got to come. Do not delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by weeping showing the tunics and, and garments which Dorcas had made which she was, when she, while she was with them. Look at all the good things she's done. Look at all the things that she's done for us. And there in that, that this, this, I guess this type of funeral service that they were having, they brought all the, the things that, that this woman had made and all the kind things they did. And they said, look at all how good she was to us. And Peter, but Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. I don't want us to glance over this because Peter, first off, took everybody out of the room. Peter perhaps remembered the story where Jesus resurrected a little girl. And Jesus, what Jesus did is that when he went in there, he kicked out almost everybody. Peter, you could come with me. But everybody, and only a couple people, everybody's out. And so Peter took everybody out. But Peter does something so important. He knelt down and prayed. As you've been noticing in, as a theme in this book of Acts, is that there is so much power in the book of Acts, but the, there was no power in the individuals. 
the power was in God. He was simply praying that God would come and do a miracle. I mean, this was never attempted by Peter before. You better pray. As a matter of fact, it was, this is not something common. I mean, Jesus, we only read of him resurrecting three people. Only one was really known in the, in the, in the, in the world, Lazarus. And so for this to happen, he needed God. And so he knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. Going back to that story of Jesus, after Jesus kicked out pretty much everybody from the room, he said, Talitha, arise. Talitha, Tabitha. Talitha, Tabitha. Those names are so similar. It's like Peter is really, truly following in the footsteps of Jesus. Jesus said, greater things will you do. You can do what I do and even greater things because I go to my Father and I'm sending you somebody. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. Peter, it's like deja vu. Tabitha, arise. And she, <gasps> opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand, just like how Jesus took the hand of that little girl. Peter took this woman's hand. He gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints, and widows, he presented her alive. Imagine the reaction. I mean, they called them over. I mean, they didn't really know what could happen. I mean, I mean, after all, this has never been done before besides Jesus. They weren't expecting much. So their jaws must have dropped when they saw that the Tabitha came out of there alive came out alive, and, went, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. People were giving their lives to God from this amazing miracle that took place. Peter, Peter, the same guy who was battling about who's the greatest, the same Peter who Jesus says, what, you can't wait for me or just uh, an hour? Why don't you pray so you don't enter temptation? Peter just a while, Peter was the guy who said, I will never deny you. I will, I will die for you, Jesus. Couldn't even stay up to pray with Jesus. First thing Peter does is he drops to his knees and he prays. Peter, who was self-confident before, now became unconfident in himself but reliant on God and became a man of prayer, trusting in the power of Jesus. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. We'll talk a little bit about Simon the tanner and tomorrow because it goes into, into, into that story a bit. But in this book, in this chapter, chapter, chapter 9, we see two stalwarts, Paul, or should I say Saul, and Peter. Two guys who had very different lives not very long ago. I mean, with Peter, I mean, you, people think that this like years past. I mean, this is not, this was like just like a couple of months ago. These lives were transformed. Today, no matter where you are in your life, God can transform it in an instant. You just got to drop to your knees and pray and ask God for that transformation. Shall we kneel right now and pray? Lord God, 
Like Peter, we no longer want to be confident in ourselves. Not confident in our ability, in our, in our Christianity, in our beliefs. No, no, no. For now on, God, we want to be unconfident in ourselves, but reliant on you. And so we come to you in prayer at this moment, asking for us to be vessels needing your filling. Fill us, God, with your Holy Spirit. Let our cup overflow so that that Holy Spirit power can ooze out of us and start blessing others. Transform us, God. Correct us so we can go and now travel on the way that you have and become truly not just a Christian, people who say we believe in Christ, but be people of the way, the way, the movement, the travel, the journey. God, put us on that movement. Put us on that journey. Put us on the way that you have for us. We pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you all for coming out today. Tomorrow we'll meet again, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 10, where we're going to we're going to talk about Simon the Tanner. We're going to look more at the story that takes place. Every day we're meeting at 730 until June 15. Thank you for coming, and I'll see you tomorrow.